we've got a lot to fit in in just uh, an hour or less. So let's dive, dive right in. The first thing I wanted to mention is you know, you're welcome to take pictures, record it, share it with your friends, great. Um, but don't stress out about taking notes. I'm going to fit a lot of information into this, but I'm videotaping it and I'll put it on my YouTube channel later. If you leave your business card out front, I'll send you the PowerPoint presentation. So don't stress out about taking notes. Um, also, I wanted to, this presentation today is about negotiations and contracts. So let's make a little deal right here. I promise I'll give you a lot of free information and I won't talk about how, how great my company is and why you should hire my services in exchange for you guys asking me some questions at the end. So I won't make it a, a pitch and I'll try to give you a lot of uh, free information, but please do ask questions at the end because the, um, the show organizer, they see if, if there are a lot of hands up, they feel that you are engaged and they'll invite me to come back next year. So I'd love to come back. So please ask some questions and make me look good. Um, all right. First off, you know, I just want to say that China is a big place. It's changing all the time. I came over as an exchange student in 1993 and never went home to America, but I don't consider myself a sourcing expert or an expert on China. It's just so big and massive. Whenever I hear somebody say they're an expert on China, I kind of roll my eyes. How can you know everything about China? So I'm just going to, maybe I'm crazy enough to share with you all the mistakes that I made. So today, I'm just going to be very open about the mistakes that I made in hopes that, that you don't make the same, uh, fall into the same pitfalls. Also, in terms of our seminar series, uh, Professor O'Connor, who is graciously videotaping the presentation today, he gave a seminar yesterday, which was fundamentally how to find suppliers. Today, I'm going to pick up the uh, baton and focus on how to manage those suppliers. So if you missed yesterday's presentation, we videotaped it. I'll show you the links at the end of, end of this session. Um, OK, a little bit about the target audience. I had a chance to ask many of you, you know, what level of experience, and we have a good mix. So I, I think the, my slides are, are appropriate. Um, depending on how much time we have, I'd like to build in at least 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Often I found that the question and answer is more valuable to the audience than the actual seminar. Now, I like to talk about managing expectations. And let me share my hope rule. This is kind of the way I do business in China. If you're flying back after the trade show, you're on the plane to your home country, and you're saying, yeah, I met a good supplier. I hope they understand my specifications. I hope they ship on time. I hope that they won't steal my intellectual property. If you have the hope, you've already lost in China. So my, the goal for my presentation today is that when you go home, you know that the supplier understood your specifications. You know that you're on the same page. So today, you know, it, it is difficult to really explain things to the supplier. And that leads me to my next slogan, that in China, nothing is easy, but everything is possible. So let me give you a few examples. Um, Today, I run a sourcing agency called Passage Maker, and we have about 150 employees. I started it 15 years ago in my apartment in Shenzhen with $2,000 that I borrowed from my parents, no customers, no employees. Now we manage about $250 million worth of product for the, my customers who are in these supply chains. Um, what's important to share with you is that I knew less than when I started this company 15 years ago then you will know today when you leave this seminar. So nothing's easy in China, but everything's possible. I'm, I'm here to prove it. I survived. I'm not a genius. I made a lot of mistakes along the way, but you can make money in China. However, it was not easy. So let me give you some real examples. Um, I'm, I have the honor of, of running the Ask the Experts panel for the Global Sources and the China Sourcing Information Center. So if you go online to Global Sources and they say, ask a sourcing expert, I'm probably the first guy that's going to get the email. So every day I'm dealing with, um, you know, dozens of supplier, I'm sorry, questions from buyers about dealing with suppliers. I'm also an avid reader of supplierblacklist.com, which is a, a website where buyers list the problems that they've had with bi bad suppliers. So every week I'm seeing hundreds of cases. Sometimes I'm directly involved, sometimes I'm just a reader and advisor, but I'm seeing some themes over and over again. And what I've learned is that often these problems could have been avoided with some, some basic due diligence, some basic good practices on the uh, buy side. 
But unfortunately, the majority of people in this room will, your project will not work out as you plan it right now. You'll either miss a lead time or the, or the supply chain won't be as smooth as you wanted or perhaps the quality issues or God forbid you make a mistake, your money disappears and you're out of business. It happens. So let me be real clear. Most buyers, I'm sorry, most suppliers here, especially at a show like Global Sources, they're not out to trick you. They're not out to steal your money. They're acceptable to good suppliers. However, a lot of buyers are new, make common mistakes, and at the end of the day, the relationship falls apart and, and both sides lose money. So I'm not saying that buyers are making mistakes or that suppliers are out to scam you. Most cases, especially at a nice trade show like this, it's, that's not the case. What I am saying is if you're a sloppy buyer and you don't follow basic protocols, which I'll explain today, there are going to be problems. You know, anything is possible, nothing is, is easy. Now let me give you the good news. After 15 years of doing this, I think I know what separates the successful sourcing programs from the ones that fail. And the people in the audience that have those five, six years of sourcing, you know, nod your head if I'm getting this right. I think there are three key fundamental areas that decide if you will fail or succeed in a China sourcing import-export business. First is market knowledge and access to your customers. Do you really understand what your customers want? If you have an idea and you have the money to finance it in China, you find a supplier, but no one wants to buy it in your home market or you don't have the means to deliver it, you've wasted all of your time. So obviously you need to have an understanding of the market. I can't help you with that in today's presentation that's outside of my area of expertise, but if you're sitting here asking yourself, how, you know, how can I get this idea to my customer, that's a big red flag. Um, the areas that I can help you with are as follows. So the three criteria for successful import-export business. You understand your customer, you have the budget in place to do it right, and the third is you understand China. So let's talk about the budget a little bit. I'm not saying you need tens of thousands of dollars if you're purchasing tens of thousands of dollars of product. You might need a few thousand dollars for a trip to China, some inspection, some auditing. If you're buying a million dollars worth of product, you might want to go a little bit further with some technical audits. So I'm just saying a little money spent wisely can protect you. So, but if you don't have the budget to do it right, you're better just taking your money and going to Macau and gambling than coming here to the trade show and placing a purchase order when you don't even have it translated into Chinese or you're not sure if the supplier actually has made this before. Don't be sloppy or you will lose your money. So let's talk about um, you know, the budget. It's outside of the scope of today's presentation, but if you want to get a feel for you know, how much does it cost to conduct a factory audit, what is lab testing, how much should I budget for logistics, what about warranty issues. You know, I've laid out um, every line item in the form of a budget for various industries and I did a five, it's almost two hours long, a five part video series. So if you want more on budgeting for China, it's a different seminar but I'll, um, I'll give you the, the link to my video. So now let's talk about the heart of today. You know, the people that know China, how to get things done in China. And as Professor O'Connor um, explained yesterday, fundamentally getting things done right in China involves three angles. Think of it as a, um, as a stool which has three legs. One leg is the guanxi or the relationship with your seller. Do you get along well? Does he understand what you're talking about? The other leg would be the documentation. Do you have good contracts? Do you have Pur uh, clear purchase order? Do you have specifications in writing? The third leg of the stable, um, the stable base would be that you have some type of independent verification. So once you have those three overlapping parts in place, you have a very safe system for sourcing in China. Some people focus too much on the relationship. They say, oh, the supplier and I are friends. He would never uh, compromise my intellectual property. And then they don't verify and they don't have the the contracts in place, that's very dangerous. So today we're going to talk about how to get all those three areas in place. So good relationship, comprehensive documentation, and independent verification. It can sound intimidating, all these things, if you're a new buyer, if you're just starting business and you're sitting here, wow, how do I put all of this into one hour? So I can't make you an expert in one hour, but I think I can demystify some of this doing China business is magical. It's not. There are systems and there are protocols that can get things done safe so that you don't have to fly home and say, I hope that 
that supplier does things right. I don't want you to hope at the end of this seminar. I want you to know that you've, you can put a system in place. So my goal today is if we draw a line between projects on this side are most likely going to fail, products on this side are going to most likely succeed. My hope is that at the end of this seminar, if we apply these tools, you'll at least be on this side of the line. I can't guarantee success, but if you put into practice the th simple things that we're going to talk about today, you're going to have a better chance of succeeding than failing. Okay, that was a, a long-winded introduction, but I am really excited to share these things with you because I've been you know, working on them for over 15 years, and, and it's time to start helping people. It really broke my heart yesterday, two days ago, I got an email from a European buyer that order for $3 million, didn't follow many of the steps that we're going to talk about, and the supplier went out of business before they could complete the order, and 30% deposit was paid. That's about a million dollars gone. And so, you know, it's not just the small buyers that are making big, big mistakes. Okay, now there's kind of two types of when a project fails and there's bad relations between the buy side and the sell side, usually the fingers are pointed at the supplier, of course, but sometimes it's because maybe the buyer gave the opportunity for the supplier to make mistakes that hurt the buyer, and sometimes the seller actually set out to scam the buyer. Sometimes it happens <coughs> at a trade show like this, there aren't, I don't know of any scammers that are actually have paid the money to set up a giant booth get visas to come to Hong Kong, sort out their passports. So you're much safer doing business at a trade show like this, a reputable one. But if you're online and you're looking for suppliers, there are scams out there. And, and let me go through a couple of them. So you might ask, you know, what type of buyer um, is more likely to have problems? You're going to have a very high risk of dealing with scammers if you fall into these categories. Your orders are small, under a couple thousand dollars. You're buying at the wholesale level or even retail level rather than factory direct. You're one of these so-called e-buyers where you feel that you can do everything virtually. You never need to actually meet the seller face to face. That's very dangerous if your orders are small. If you're dealing in a product that is high value but small size, meaning the scammer can get a lot of money out of you for a small package, SD cards, USB drives, um, some circuitry, if these are targeted by scam artists. And then they also prey on the buyers that are ignorant enough to think that you can buy an Apple product out the back door of the Apple factory in China. Foxconn's not going to sell you the, uh, an iPhone at half the rate they sell to, to the U.S. I'm sorry, to Apple. I'll go through that in a minute. Also, novice buyers are targets, and the scam artists can smell you, smell you a mile away when you send an email and you say, I'm looking to buy 50 units, what's your price? And they look at your website, they kind of see that you're a novice buyer, so they play the game and they try to get money out of you. I'm going to go through all of this. So even if you're not a novice buyer, but you're in these areas, you got to be really careful. Okay, now why can't you buy Sony products and Apple products here at the trade show at a price that's much lower because it's made in China, right? Well, there's a, a couple different reasons. Just because it's made here doesn't mean it's sold here. Um, where I live in Shenzhen, my neighbors made a business going back and forth between USA or Hong Kong or Dubai and Singapore and importing products like Apple and high-end electronics that were made in China but sold overseas. They would actually bring them back into China. The reason is that the taxation in China is such that um, your consumer pays a higher, higher price for the same product, even if it's made in China. So you, you're unlikely to get a a wholesale price on an Apple product, for example, in China. It just doesn't happen for tax reasons. Also, the uh, you know Apple and these famous brands, Samsung, what have you, they have very tight relationships with their suppliers. Um, and if you do get an order out the back door, it might be fake. Poor uh, French woman doing business in Dubai, she wrote me and she said, Mike, I followed some of your tips, but not all of them. And uh, I thought I was buying iPhones, and I was going to be really smart. I told the supplier, I'm not paying you um, the second payment until it ships. And she thought she was getting iPhones. As soon as I saw this email, I knew where it was going. So the Chinese seller, a scam artist, put, uh, oh, the order is for 70,000 euros, put 70,000 euros worth of second-hand phones that were broken, different brands, put it into a container, 
in order to show the French buyer that, look, it's the bill of lading, the product's ready to ship. So that happy French buyer says, oh, it's on the, it's on the water, it must be safe, here's the second payment. Then this junk shows up that she can't sell. So long story short, she shouldn't have been shopping for a product that's not available to begin with. She was seduced by the siren song of this low price, and she didn't do her homework to protect herself. If she had, if any of those red flags were raised and she paid attention, she would have saved a lot of money. Okay, why do the scam artists target fall, small foreign buyers? Because there's a lot of them, they're easy to find, and when they take your money, you can't go after them. You know, it's pretty easy to hide from someone that doesn't have um, a legal team or the ability to pay a couple thousand bucks to hire an investigator. So they prey on small foreign buyers. Um, you know, also small buyers tend to gamble a little bit more. Um, they also assume that there's a safety net, like back home. When I buy a product on Amazon and it's faulty, you know, there's better business bureaus, I can, can write a comment. When you buy a product from Asia, China in particular, something goes wrong, you know, the police aren't going to help you unless your order is really big. If you're going to write a scam report, who's going to listen? You know, there is supplierblacklist.com, but um, there's not a, an entity that goes, that's out there to protect you. Um, so small buyer beware. Okay, this is another real story. Um, in this case, I'm sad to say it was an Indian buyer. I couldn't believe it, but this Indian buyer thought that they could get two of these machines for 400 US dollars. So they write me an email saying, Mike, I followed some of your tips, but not all of them. And I thought I was, getting to, I was going to get rich by importing two of these machines into India and selling them for a lot. So, well, what was the price? I thought I could get a two of them for $400. Can you show me the, the, the purchase order? Oh, I didn't use a purchase order. I just sent the money. I, I really trusted the supplier. This is the actual website. So what do you guys see wrong with this? A, you know, that's a European road with a European driver. It's not even in China. This product isn't available in China. The factory provides segways, jet skis, motorcycles. I mean, Mitsubishi and General Electric combined don't have a product range this big. So obviously, something is, is being outsourced or fabricated. You know, the, even the name sounds fake. And, the, and when you visit these scam suppliers, it's like they all build their scam website from the same template. It's the same girl making the, picking up the phone call, uh, even though behind it, it's probably two guys in, a, in an empty warehouse. Um, so what was, when I looked, I said, all right, just for the sake of argument, let's say that $400 was reasonable for an ATV. What other red flags did you miss, Mr. Customer? One, the factory size on the, on the website said 500 square meter, 5,000 square meters, but the address, I know because I looked it up on Google Maps, is somebody's apartment. Wow, that's a pretty big apartment for 5,000 square meters. Um, the other is the number of, uh, of employees, 100 to 500. Well, that's a pretty big range. We have 1 to 10,000 employees. Um, you know, the factories usually are very specific. We have 75 employees. Um, also, please, come on. Are you going to do business with a factory that uses a Hotmail and Yahoo.cn free account? That's, that's a red flag. Um, some more technical things. If your factory doesn't have a Chinese website, that's a big red flag because Chinese factory owners love to show off all the great stuff that they're doing in their factory. So most websites have a lot of Chinese. If the website is only English, they're targeting foreign buyers for good or bad. Um, the contact phone number was a cell phone. The area codes of the cell phone and, I'm sorry, the phones and fax and different branches didn't match the addresses. It was just a mess. Um, the quotation, when a professional factory gives you a quote, it's very clear about what is included, what isn't. The quotation for that ATV was something, $400, two units blue. Okay, you know, if I was buying a vehicle, I would expect a spec sheet, you know, what tires, what engine, that kind of stuff. So if, if you're, this buyer was kind of silly, but believe me, this is happening every day. I, I hope I'm not insulting anyone. Um, and obviously, if it's too good to be true. Now, what is a little bit tricky is the website did say authenticated and verified. Oh, really? They must be authenticated and verified then. No. You know, they just cut and pasted the logo from the major websites like Global Sources and the other ones and said, we're authenticated. They even had like a SGS tag. But anybody with Photoshop can do this. So if the buyer had just, if everything else looked legit, 
the buyer should have at least verify that and say, hey, send, send me a, a copy of your, of your certs. Show me your, your, um, you know, where you've been authenticated and verified. Let me talk to a few references. That's free. It doesn't cost you anything to check that out. Okay, so um, here are the, the classic scams that I used to run into a couple years ago. The class, this is like a sandwich menu, but um, we have the classic, which is just somehow the supplier, the scam artist gets your business, then they ignore you. They change their emails, they stop taking the phone calls. This happens a lot when your order is under $2,000 and the supplier realizes that you're not going to get lawyers involved. You're not going to pay another $1,000 to, to get a due diligence, I'm sorry, an investigator. So it's just pick your money and run. Then there's the, it's on the way. This is a little bit more complex where it's like that the French woman that I told you about where um, they give the perception that the order has shipped provision of documents, bill of lading, but what's inside that package might be different than what you wanted. So they kind of trick you into giving more payments. I, I saw a box, uh, a carton full of rocks show up one time, rocks in a box. And the paperwork clearly said that it was electronics. It's because someone at the scam artist paid someone at the customs bureau to ship this out as electronics when really it was just a box full of rocks. Long story short, in that case, as buyers, we need to do some type of quality control, independent inspection before we sell. Um, and then milk the cow, this one I see all the time. It's where the supplier usually gives a really good price to get your business. They're 10% lower than anybody else, but they're not like half of the price of others. So you think that it, you just found a great deal by doing your homework online, and now you're getting a good price. But then, Every week is, oh, you wanted batteries with that? Oh, I didn't know you wanted it in a box. You wanted it under your label? Oh, you wanted it palletized? You know, every excuse to get more and more money out of you, and now the price is much higher than anyone else. And then, if they actually have the product, they may ship it to you. If they're scamming you, uh, there's no product or company. So, once again, they've just found a way to get money or more money out of you. The most common trick that you'll see in the last six months is um, they will say, our product is, is ready to ship. It's at the customs border. It's just about ready to pick, be pit, picked up by FedEx. But I didn't realize that we needed a certain export license. And to get that new license is going to cost $600 more. Can you, as soon as you pay us, we can ship it. So they give the perception that, all right, this is the last payment I have to make. It wasn't negotiated. Here's the $600. Then, oh, we got the HS code wrong. We need $50 more. You would not believe this. I've seen email chains like a mile long with 50 excuses to get $10 here, $50 there, and there was never any product to begin with. <laughs> it was never, it was just a, it was a fake company. All right, so these advanced scams, um, we don't have time to go through them today, but if you visit chinasourcinginfo.org and you type in scam, you especially the Shanghai Surprise and Zhejiang Screwjob, there's tons of information about how these scams work, but essentially it is an employee with or without the consent of the factory owner, maybe it's an account manager at that factory that you've dealt with for many years. Here's a real case. So an account manager gets fired from a factory. You don't know about it yet because you only talk to them once a month. You don't talk to them daily. So they contact you via Skype, and that's how you usually communicate with them. Or maybe they send an email from their Hotmail account because they normally send you via Hotmail rather than the corporate account. And they say, oh, by the way, we've had some changes, and here's our new bank account information for your new purchase order. So it looks legit, right? You've known this person, but they've already been fired, and they're telling you to send money to their personal account. And so the one last week was 70, 70 this Australian company in Mel Sydney sent 70000 Australian dollars to their an, a former employee of their supplier who was just released, and that that employee disappeared. They'd already been fired. They got the money from. They probably contacted every customer that they dealt with and said, "Here's a new bank account. You want to get that PO going? Send the money. They're gone." So, even if you hire the investigator to go find them, um, the chances that they haven't spent the money or you're going to get it back. Maybe you're going to get the moral victory of having them sit in jail for a couple of years, but that doesn't help your business. Maybe you feel better about it, but it's too late. So if you're not scared already, <laughs> um, the good, here's some good news. These could have all been avoided, all right? So how do we avoid them? First, we find legitimate suppliers to begin with. And Global Sources put me on the spot. They said, Mike, in one slide, I want you to tell this, these audience members how to find a legitimate 
supplier. So in this case, a factory. Like, you know, that's kind of hard. Uh, 15, it's taken me 15 years to figure that out. And I wrote a book that was 300 pages on that very question. And then I put it in these 10 videos, which are at Global Sources, as well as the Sourcing Information Center. And now I'm going to put it into one PowerPoint slide. So drum roll, please. Here are the basic steps to find a supplier. First, ask yourself, what would the dream supplier look like? And it's going to be different for each of you. It might be they're close to uh, raw material, or they're near a port, or they're somewhere where you do business a lot. Maybe they have experience selling to a certain market. Maybe you're a small buyer, so you're hoping that they're a small factory. Whatever the dream supplier is, you write that down before you start going to Global Sources, before you go to the trade show, certainly before you go online. So know what you're looking for. Then you go online, and the problem won't be finding a supplier. It'll be finding the right supplier. So be picky. You know, you've made that list of attributes. Let's say that you're buying a watch, and you want to find a supplier for whatever that, that deals in Brazilian leather to add to their Made in China watch. So if that's important for you. So you go through those websites that you found on Global Sources. You look, who has experience with, a, with uh, leather? OK, I found three. This other guy, he uses synthetic. Well, maybe you don't throw them away, but don't put them in the top pile. Because there will be a perfect vendor out there, and there'll be a lot that you'll start thinking, maybe they could if I work with them. Because there's so many, just put the not quite right pile over here, and then focus on the, the high potential ones here. And here's a tip. Don't focus on price at this phase when you're narrowing it from dozens down to four or five. Because what you will do is you will subconsciously gravitate to who has the best price. And usually the best price is not the best overall cost. What I mean is sometimes there's a low unit price, but then there's a lot of expenses you have on fixing problems, traveling to China, building their quality systems for you. So don't worry about price. Focus on finding the supplier that meets your attributes. Um, and then you do a bit of you know, auditing and due diligence. Because due diligence can cost a 200 to $500. You don't want to do it on 20 factories, but you, if you're a small buyer, you want to do it on the top two or three, then you start talking about price, and later in today's presentation, we'll, we'll structure the negotiations. Then you do a test order, then you do the full order. So don't skip from step, uh, step two to six. That's very dangerous. Test orders are, are so important, especially if you're, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where the actions or inactions of the supplier can put you out of business. You're up against a deadline. You need to get red umbrellas um, you know, to, to the rainforest before the rain season starts. And if you're a day late, you're out of business. That's very dangerous for a first order with a supplier you're just starting to put in place. So do those test orders. Be careful. You know, maybe extend your lead times if possible. OK, um, now let's talk about negotiation. Um, you're in, you come all this way to China. You're probably going to hit a couple trade shows. You're going to hop in a car. You're going to go visit some suppliers, ideally. You're going to really, it's going to open your eyes when you cross the border into China. And sooner or later, you're going to be at a table, either at a restaurant, most likely, or perhaps in a boardroom. And it's going to be your, you surrounded by uh, the Chinese team negotiating some kind of deal. And um, here's a really short pr prep for, to get you ready. Um, first. Don't make the mistake that I made early on in my career of focusing on the person that speaks English rather than the person that makes the decision. As foreign buyers, we tend to gravitate towards the person we think understands. And usually that's some recent graduate from an English language school that maybe studied abroad in your country and you know they're a pleasure to talk to. They know they know all the pop stars and the hot movies and and they, you get a feel that they know what, what you're all about and that why you're here. But they don't have any decision power in the office. And most likely, those people change jobs a lot. So they might not even be around in six months when the order's about ready to be placed. However, when you're in the meeting room, if there is somebody that makes a decision, the general manager, division leader, you, you, even if they don't speak your language, you can use the interpreter. So my suggestion would be, you know, work with the interpreter, but you look at Mr. Lee, the general manager, and say, Mr. Lee, it's a pleasure. We've come all the way here from Buffalo, New York, and uh, I like the, the style of your factory. Uh, how many years have you been in business? What are you planning to do? 
you don't do it like this. Hey, ask Mr. Lee how business and where does he plan to be in five years. You know, let Mr. Lee, the general manager, see that you're trying to communicate with him, that you respect that he's the the uh, decision maker. So that translator, you know, should should be just for that translator. Don't try to let her lead the negotiation or spend all your time, you know, going to to um, you know, sightseeing with the interpreter, just in hopes that it builds a relationship with the factory, because you're building a relationship with the wrong person. Um, <laughs> have a Baijiu back door. So Baijiu is this very strong white liquor that's available in China. And um, my culture back home, it kind of frowns on having alcohol at a management meeting or at a lunch table. I've been in China negotiating deals in the morning for breakfast alcohol was brought out. So there's, it's a very different culture in China. Now, it's not like a fraternity where they're forcing you to drink. You don't have to participate. You know, if, if you don't want to participate, just say, hey, for religious reasons or I'm just, you know, jet lag, I don't feel like having a drink. They're not going to force it on you. They're not going to feel uncomfortable. Usually, especially if the supplier, maybe their English is a little bit choppy, they're a little bit nervous, so they're kind of trying to calm their nerves by having a few drinks. Um, what will happen is you will go into a nice restaurant or a room and you'll be sit, you'll, there'll be a big round table with the lazy Susan in the middle that spins around with all these wonderful Chinese delicacies. On your right will be the most important person in the meeting, meaning the general manager, owner of the factory. <laughs> On your left will be probably the interpreter or somebody that's uh, kind of low level. You'll be facing the door with your back to maybe a window so that you can see who comes in and, out, in, in and out. That is the seat of honor in most meetings. So you'll be positioned there with the, the head person. And what will happen, the people that have been there say, yep, I know it's coming, is that the youngest person will say, oh, Mike, you've made it all the way from Buffalo. We're so happy. Can I share a small shot of Baijiu with you? You're looking at this shot. It's tiny. Okay, Gambe. Okay, five minutes later, that um, person's uh, superior, maybe the sourcing team, I'm sorry, the sales team leader says, Mike, you've come all the way from Buffalo. We're so happy to see you here. Can I have a drink with you? You can't say no because then that person loses face because you had a drink with their subordinate. And then you look around the table and you see there's 12 people. And then, uh-oh, you know, that's going to be a long lunch meeting if we have to go back and negotiate a contract. So I like to participate but not over-participate. So what I will do is um, you know, try to encourage everyone to have a drink together, kind of American style rather than one-on-one. -on -one. Or what I usually do, especially if most of the deal has been negotiated and there's not a lot to, to do after the meeting, is I'll bring some liquor with me and say, oh, great, um, have, I'd li I brought some special liquor from America. I br give it to you as a gift so that when I have your by Joe, would you like Jose Cuervo or perhaps some Jim Beam from America? And they find that stuff as disgusting as I do by Joe. So suddenly we stop doing these silly drinks and everybody focuses on business, yet I get a lot of credit for bringing some, some gift and participating. So that's my little Baijiu backdoor. Um, in terms of using a translator, bring your own translator if you don't speak Chinese. Because what will happen is the translator that works for the factory will tell you what they think you need to hear rather than what's going on. I speak Chinese, and I don't always tell my suppliers that I speak Chinese when I go into these meetings. And this is what I heard one time. Went into the meeting, and we asked the question, what is the lead time? And and I was the only person on my side. The supplier didn't realize I spoke Chinese. And in front of me, the engineer says, how can we give a lead time? We don't know what the bill of material is and how long it will take to organize the bill of material. The financial director says, well, as long as we get paid up front, who cares what lead time we say? And then the, the sales manager says, I remember at the trade show they were talking about a 15-day lead time. So what does the salesperson say? 15-day lead time. They didn't know what the lead time was, but that's what the interpreter says to get your business. So if you have a, the interpreter works for you, and you can find them you know, online, you can find them at, the, at trade shows, you can find them at hotels. You know, the, most hotels have a directory of, of translators and interpreters. You know, a couple hundred bucks a day to go on an important meeting with you, and now they're listening for what's going on around the factory. It's just as important when you walk through the assembly line, what are people saying as it is sitting in the boardroom. So. Um, I talked about kind of being sneaky, and if you have a you know a Lao Wai like this that speaks Chinese, maybe don't disclose it right away. Um, but don't let it happen to you in reverse. So I remember this project where we had the big project the, in automotive, so 
high volume stuff for General Motors and, and Toyota, like components. And so the, the top managers from the different divisions all meet at the Pudong Airport. So Mr. Smith flies in from, from Detroit and, and uh, Yamada was from, from Tokyo or something. And uh, so all the managers get together and they land at the Pudong Airport at about the same time. And the, um, the factory will usually send a van to pick you up. So the van driver comes over with a sign, Mr. Yamada, Mr. Smith, and the van driver says, you know, no speak English, drive, drive. And so, okay, they get in the car. It's a two-hour ride from the Pudong Airport up into Zhejiang where the factory is. And over that long ride, of course, the managers are talking about their strategy. Now, the meeting happens the next day, and Mr. Smith, he's like, it's like they knew our strategy. They knew what we were talking about. How is this possible? Do they have a microphone in the car? And I'm like, wait, who, who drove the car? And he tells me, describes him like, that's the general manager's son. He was an exchange student at Oxford. So the guy was just sitting there, <laughs> pretending to be the driver, listening to the conversation in the back. <laughs> so just because someone has a Chinese face <laughs> doesn't mean they speak English. And also, often, a lot of, uh, because the education system in China focuses on uh, reading and writing rather than spoken, sometimes people have great listening skills, but they, they don't speak in, in English. So you know, just because someone appears not to understand is not 100% sure that they really don't understand what you're talking about. Okay, so long story short, you're probably asking, Mike, we're, we're 30 minutes into this and you haven't told me how to get a good price. Here it is. The Chinese have been negotiating with each other for 5,000 years of continuous history. My Chinese father-in-law is always telling me. So after 5,000 years, it's not like you and I are going to jump in with superior negotiation ninjutsu and find a way to get a better price. You know, the, the American mentality of a negotiation is two people sit down in a room, who's ever the better negotiator is going to get a better price. Throw that way of doing business out the door. In China, you don't really know when the negotiation starts or ends. It might be over dinner, it might have been in the car ride when you were giving away your, your secrets. Though I've found that the only way to out-negotiate the Chinese in terms of price is to out-research them. What I mean is don't rely on your negotiation skills, rely on your research skills. So my negotiations generally are pretty short because I did a lot of homework up front. Mr. Lee, it's a pleasure to be here. I've enjoyed the couple rounds of Baijiu. I hope you enjoy Jose Cuervo as much as I enjoy Baijiu. And uh, we've become friends. I like your factory. Um, but part of my protocol for doing business is that my research team checks out some factory prices. And Mr. Lee, I love your factory, but Mr. Wong, two, you know, um, a couple provinces over can produce the same product at excellent quality for 7.3% less than you. Can you split the difference, Mr. Lee? So it's almost a take it or leave it. But as soon as Mr. Lee knows that which province I went to and that 7.3 was a legitimate number, it's not something that I pulled out of my, you know, pulled out of the hat and just made it up for negotiation that as soon as he knows that I know what he knows, then the negotiation is really easy, kind of yes or no. And I always negotiate with that in a respectful way. Don't go in and say, I found a supplier that's 75% less than you. Because if he knows you're making it up, you're going to lose the negotiation, you're going to lose respect. So if, if you do have an idea of the pricing by using those tips that we talked about before, about how to find, you know, let this research make your negotiation easier. Okay, now, You've negotiated, let's talk about how do we protect ourselves. We've talked about scams out there. So assuming that you're, you've gotten the scam artists out of the way. So now we're talking about how do you protect yourself with a legitimate buyer. I'm sorry, a legitimate seller. And when I say legitimate, um, I mean that it's a real company, but ideally that it has, um, you're going to find out if it has legitimate quality, legitimate experience making the product that you want. So when we say a legitimate factory, it's not just do they exist, but also are they right for me? Um, so here's how to protect yourself. A lot of small or first time buyers come to me and say, Mike, I'm tight on cash flow. Um, the supplier wants 100% up front. What do I do? I can't afford that. Well, generally, everything is a negotiation. Price, lead time, quality level, you know, the, uh, the design, and especially the terms. So when a supplier says to you 100% up front, that's just his opening gambit. He's hoping that you'll agree to it, but you have a right to say, well, you know what, I was looking for maybe 50-50 or something like that. So if you, what, if you find a good supplier 
and these payment terms are a bit sticky, lay out a roadmap. Say to them, OK, you want 50-50 up front, 50% up front, and then 50% after it ships. All right, I can work with that as long as I have an independent QC take place before the second payment. You might say, well, I'm going to work on that for the first order, but after time, I want to be at 10% deposit and then the remaining 90 on 30-day net terms. But I, let me prove myself that I'm a good buyer. So I plan to place five orders over the next year, and each time that I place the order on time, I pay on time, you give me a little bit better terms. So you negotiate a road map. That's a lot easier than just trying to twist the arm of the supplier you just met to get preferential terms. Unless you carry a lot of leverage in terms of a big order, you're just not going to get it. Um, I use a 30-40-30 a lot, especially when I'm trying to avoid bank, um, like letters of credit, and if I want to avoid bank financing on medium orders, like under $100,000, I use a 30-40-30 because it's good for me and it's fair to the supplier. 30% upfront deposit, 40% after independent inspection before the goods ship out of China, and the final 30 after it's been delivered. The reason it's good for the supplier is notice that they get 70% of the product before it ships China. That means for them, God forbid you can't pay the remaining 30% or there's a hurricane and the shipment gets lost at sea, they've at least covered most of their internal expenses. So their risk is minimized. Also, they can use that 30% to pay for the raw materials up front and prime the supply chain. So 30, 40, 30 is good for them as well as for you. But this has no protection for you if you skip the inspection. If you just say, I'm going to pay you the 40% upon provision, provision of shipping documents, you might get a pile of rocks. So you've got to have some type of QC integrated with the payment. You use the payment as the, uh, you know, as the carrot and the QC as the stick. All right. At the end of the day, when we worry about will I lose money or not, unless you're, you're assuming that you've got rid of the scams and assuming that the supplier is legitimate, um, then you really should be worried about quality because quality you know, and lead time, these are the areas where they cause friction with the buyer and lawsuits and lost money. So if you've got a good QC quality control system in place, you're not going to have financial exposure. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Now, if you are worried about traditional risk, traditional risk is that the supplier is going to go out of business before they can complete your order, like happened to the, uh, that million dollars that I told you about, million euros. Um, well, one is you can go to supplierblacklist.com for free and see if, this, if your supplier is listed. Do they have a bad reputation? Ask them for references. If a supplier can't give you the references of a couple happy customers, run away. Um, another thing that is free, how long have they been on Global Sources? Okay, they're at this trade show. Have they been coming to the show for five years? Have they paid Global Sources top dollar for um, advertising in the Global Sources magazines? You know, if they've been around for a while, it's not a guarantee, but it's a higher likelihood that they will be around tomorrow. So those are free things. Everyone loves free stuff. Now let's talk about affordable ones, and I think essential. You know, some type of third-party audit. I'm on the board of advisors with Asia Quality Focus. I can introduce inspection agencies. I don't want to make a, a sales pitch. I just want to say you got to do your audits and your due diligence to confirm that the, the supplier is legit before you make any substantial payments. The good news is these are hundreds, not thousands of dollars. And if you're sitting here saying, you know, I don't have $100 to spend to get things done right, you know, that goes back to my original point about you have to have the budget or don't do it. Go to Macau. Okay, so here are 10 lessons I learned the very hard way over my 15 years that relate to contracts. And I'm going to bang through them really quick. Um, please use a purchase order. Don't order something with just a, an email. That's not a legally binding document. Um, State your lead times and penalties. What's going to happen if the lead time is missed? If you pre-agree to it, there is a higher likelihood that it will be adhered to. If you don't even mention the lead time, what if the supplier gets another order that's bigger than yours? Yours will be delayed. Um, if you're worried about intellectual property, have a plan in advance. You should ask the question, what will happen if these products have problems? Usually, you're at the trade show. You're so excited. You're just worried about getting it shipped. You don't think about, well, what happens if there are some problems? Is the supplier going to send the replacement parts to me at his expense? Who's going to pay for the rework to be done in the Netherlands? You know, in my 15 years of doing business in China, not one single time did
did I have a Chinese supplier say to me, Mike, I'm sorry you got defective parts. Let me replace them for free. Never once until I started putting it in my contract that if there are defective parts, the, the supplier has to provide me a discount on the next order or better yet, uh, a rebate or replacement parts or ideally just a credit towards the order that hasn't shipped because I do my inspection in China before the goods ships out. Believe it or not, I know some Chinese suppliers that ship defective product on purpose. Why, you might say? Because now they've got defects in your hands and you say to them, oh, we got 2% defect rate, what are we going to do? The supplier is going to say, you know what, we'll, get, we'll replace those on the next order. They use that as a tool to lock you in on a future order. I, I had suppliers ship defects on purpose in order to lock in multiple orders. Okay, jurisdiction, I'm sorry, I skipped this one. If things, the supplier might tell you, hey, we have, um, you know, we're CE certified for electronics, FCC America, don't worry, we have international liability if something goes wrong, if some baby burns their finger on the battery, it's on us. No, it's not, you're the importer of record. The lawyers and the government and the regulatory bodies in your country are not going to go after a Chinese supplier in China with no assets in your home country. They're going to go after you as the importer of record. So if you're importing the product, it's up to you to make sure that it's safe, that it conforms. So you know that, that's, it is scary, especially when you're small and the process of just confirming is this microphone safe or not, that can be thousands of dollars. So China isn't for the small buyer. Um, it is hard to start small and grow, but either you do it right or you don't do it, you might take a gamble, but you know, be aware that it's the, you're the importer of record. If you have some customized product, say you're opening tooling in China, um, you're taking this, that's a bad example, you're taking this microphone and then you're changing the design of it to match your market needs. That design is just for you. What happens almost all the time is the sell side will say, hey, you want this design? No problem. We'll open the tools and molds in-house and I'll amortize it onto the order. So you buy 10,000 units and I won't charge you. When there is a problem, it's always between unit 0 and 1, very rarely between unit 9,999 and 10,000. So what will happen is the supplier now owns, your, they have the tooling, and the supplier isn't someone you want to do business with. But you can't, go to a, you can't get the tooling out of the factory because you don't legally own it. So if you're doing anything customized, I highly recommend you have clear contracts, and ideally you pay for the tooling separate. I even um, know of a service called a tool and die steward where the factory, after the tooling has been made, it goes to a third party and sits there between orders. So if the relationship falls apart, the buyer can take the tooling and, and go elsewhere. So um, I've seen cases where the buyer said, hey, you're a terrible factory. Um, I want my tooling back. You can't send in the police because the buyer doesn't really own the tooling if they don't have the contract. And now that, that buy, the, the buyer has made the seller mad, so the seller owns the tooling, keeps making production and selling it to competitors. So you, know, you can't stop it unless you own the tooling. All right. Enough on that. Jurisdiction, I guarantee your lawyer back home is going to say, put the jurisdiction of this contract in your city. Why? In hopes of billing you a couple hundred dollars an hour if anything goes wrong. But at the end of the day, your lawyer back home is, can't, even if you win a court case in Spain, it's going to have no bearing in China. They won't, it, it just, you can't enforce it. So contracts, I believe, should be in the district where the seller has their assets. Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. If they have an office in Madrid, great. Then maybe it might make sense to have Spain. But usually their assets are at the factory where there's equipment. They can't disappear. So put the jurisdiction there. Bilingual contracts. If you've done all of these things, but you forgot to put it in Chinese, and then it does go to court, now the lawyers are going to have an, a debate about what is the proper interpretation of the court. So the court will assign a lawyer, but I'm sorry, will assign a translator, but then the, the lawyers for the defendant will say, you know, that's not quite the right wording. And they'll stall this out for months or years just by fighting over the translation rather than what is the, the heart of the contract. So don't give your supplier's lawyer a chance to, to fight over the translation. Get the contract bilingual up front and sign. As I've said a hundred times in the presentation, link your payments to performance. You know, if you're placing an order to China, you got to do some type of inspection before it ships out and before you make that final payment. Um, 
I actually staple the QC specifications to the purchase order. So your specifications should be an integral part of your buying documentation. If you want to see what a quality manual looks like, you can visit my website at psschina.com. It's under Project Quality Manual. So sometimes my simple purchase order is one page and then 10 pages of QC documentation. I want this microphone with, with ABS plastic with Japanese battery number 769. You know, the, the more specific you can be, the better chance it, it will actually get delivered. I was told to give 10 lessons. I'm going to give a bonus 11th. Um, before you make a payment, make sure that the name on the contract matches the name on the bank account, matches the name on the factory gate. If those things match, it's fairly safe. You would not believe how many times I hear about a Chinese factory receiving payment to their Hong Kong trading company or perhaps their general manager's personal account in Hong Kong. Sounds nice. They didn't mean to, to, to trick you. But then if something goes wrong, where are you going to sue them? The, you go to court in China and they say, wait, yeah, we have a purchase order from you, but we have no receipt of funds to our corporate accounts. And you say, well, I sent you... I sent the money to, to Mr. Mr. Uh, Lee in Hong Kong. Well, Mr. Lee doesn't work for us anymore. Do you have a purchase order with Mr. Lee? No. So in both jurisdictions, your hands are tied. Long story short, the name should be the same on the contract, the bank account, and the factory gate. All right. Um, I love this. Uh, the single big, now we're talking about project management. Um, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that has taken place. So often, you have the Western buyer verbally describing what needs to happen. I want to have you know, these specifications, blah, 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 via email. Is the factory really understanding it? You know, just like here, the directions get convoluted. So I really encourage you to, to have things written down if it's important and bilingual. You know, make it really clear. Paris versus Bali. I love this. One of my coworkers, he's also married to a, a Chinese wife, and he's starting to learn some Chinese. And uh, he wanted to take her to Bali. Now, Bali and Paris in Chinese are very similar. The tones are off by a little bit, Bali and Bali Dao. And so it sounds similar. So they get ready to go to the airport in the middle of, in, uh, to, Brian's going to take her to Bali in Indonesia. And his wife's got suitcases with jackets and furs. And she thought she was going to Paris. So imagine <laughs> if we're going to spend Christmas in Paris, she's saying, oh, so romantic. But actually, he was going to Bali. So. He thought that he communicated very well where the family vacation was going. But in reality, you know, she thought it was a different continent. If that can happen in a marriage, imagine what happens when your supplier is on the other side of the world and you're dealing in, in different languages. So um, I encourage you to be very specific. If it's worth telling your supplier about, then it's worth writing down and having it systematically repeatable. OK, um, I'm going to take a couple minutes to talk about project management. So often. I've been to factories where they make a great product, great QC system, amazing spotless factory. You could eat off the floor, management worth, you know, really good people. Yet they don't have software for project management. Their account managers are really salespeople, meaning they're great at getting the, getting the order, but terrible at giving you updates. So there isn't a mentality about customer service here that you might have in Europe or America. So before I place the order, I ask my suppliers, hey, tell me about your project management software. Oh, uh, we have Outlook. Uh, you know, that's really not a project management software. Oh, uh, we use Excel sheets. Okay, getting bare, better, what are the fields on that Excel sheet? So my, my supplier has no concept of buyer beware. You might end up doing the project management on your order to China. So how do you make it easier for yourself? You know, set up a, a simple spreadsheet that says we need to keep tags on, you know, what's the task, current status, deadline, additional notes. These are so obvious to anyone that does project management back home. But suppliers, sometimes they, they think that, I'm, that I've uh, just revolutionized international communications by making a spreadsheet with these 10 items. So I put them in Chinese so that when I send you the PowerPoint, you can cut and paste and use them as you see fit. Um, I also get sick of dealing with the time zone. So you've got Chinese team in China, the American team in America. If they're in New York, it's 12 hours difference. So if you miss the opportunity to get a clear answer to your email, you have to wait to the next communication cycle. So a question of, is that pen red or blue, might take five days to answer. Um, of course, you can use Skype and phone, but if you're dealing with emails, things can get a little bit messy. So I'll send, you know, I'll leave your business card, I'll give you this. As my coworkers will know, 
I have this checklist taped to every, every computer monitor in my office for every employee, international employee or Chinese. And it's obvious things like, if you say there's going to be an attachment, is it attached? Who hasn't made that mistake, right? But when you only have a 12-hour 12, 12 cycle, you've got to make sure that attachment gets out. Um, did you do a spell check? Are you using any, you know, are you trying to, are you being facetious or using humor? You know, keep it simple. Just a checklist about, are you CCing the right people? I can't say how many times my team, my Chinese staff, you know, there's so many mics out there that I get a lot of emails to mic at something else that weren't for me. So um, imagine if the wrong information falls in the wrong hands. So have, your, have, the, have both teams sending the right stuff to the right people. It's a little bit hard to see, but I'll be happy to send you the list. OK. Um, in the last five minutes, I, talk a little, I want to talk a little bit about quality. Everyone loves free stuff. So how do you, how do you confirm that your supplier has good quality systems? You know, it's not just ISO. Everybody thinks ISO is the end all and be all. But I can have a factory that is fully ISO compliant making concrete life jackets. Now, you put on a concrete life jacket and jump into the water, you're not going to be saved. But my system for making the concrete life jacket could be ISO compliant. ISO is not about product quality or safety. It's about systems for making things. Um, so if a factory says they're ISO compliant, great. They might have just spent $2,000 to pay, pay one of the ISO auditors to get the report faked and put it on the wall for marketing purposes. But let's say that they really want to be an ISO level factory. Then you ask them, OK, show me your quality manual. And if they don't have a written manual that demonstrates how do they make parts, run away. Because in, in China, you know, staff don't show up on time after the holidays. There's typhoons. You know, there's always something going on. You can't rely on the people to remember how to make a part. You need to re rely on a system that trains the people. So in my factories, for example, I, give the, I like to say, if 20% of your workforce was replaced tomorrow, of course there would be some training. But you, do you have the system to train those people? If Mr. Lee got sick and I had to fill his job, could I sit down at the workstation and read how do the tools work? How, what is the appropriate specifications? What is go, no-go gauges? It should be so simple that any person on the supply chain, I'm sorry, at the production level, could easily be replaced if needed. That's a, a great system. And you can see the one at the website I mentioned. Ask for references. If the supplier can't give you a couple references, you know, run away. You might say, the supplier might say, well, I don't want to give references because then you know my customers and they might be your competitors. All right, I'm in America. Give me a reference to somebody that you have in Australia or South Africa. We don't compete. Just let me talk to them. And then usually you can get a couple of references and you ask, how's the quality? You know, I've made calls where the, the, where the other buyer said, this supplier is terrible. Don't do business with them. So you know, imagine that. Um, then, of course, I'm not going to do business. All right. Once again, I talked about the 30, 40, 30. The, more, the key point is link your payments to performance. And then inexpensive tools, lab testing, product inspection, blah, blah, blah. We talked about that before. OK. There, before, I asked who's interested in intellectual property, and only three people raised their hands. So I spent more on um, quality control and project management. But if you are worried about intellectual property, I've got other videos that I've done that, that explain the four components of a, a proper program. You need to, you know, of course, up front, register it. China's first to register rather than first to market. So if I'm here at the trade show and I say, hey, you've got a really great idea. I like your brand and logo. And then I beat you to Beijing, you're going to have to pay me to get your logo back. So I like to advise that, that buyers, if they have intellectual property to protect, get it registered before you go sourcing in China, before you even place the purchase order. The good news is it's very affordable, English-speaking lawyers. I'm on the board of advisors with a couple law firms. I'll get you pointed in the direction if you need help. It's going to be a lot less expensive to deal with an English-speaking lawyer in China than to have your lawyers back home go through their partnership and interpreters. You end up paying three, four times more. So you can get a logo registered for hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars, and you're really protected. Limit your production, limit your exposure. You know, don't walk around the trade show with your new design and ask 15 potential suppliers, "Can you make this for me?" Because you're going to probably place the order with one supplier. What about those other 14 suppliers? Now you've given them everything they need to copy you. So 
I sometimes walk around with a dummy product that's similar to what I want to buy, but it doesn't expose any uh, proprietary information. Um, there are services out there called Black Box Assembly where maybe you've got a great design for the clasp. Okay, so the clasp comes from a clasp manufacturer, the, the um, mechanics from another supplier, the leather from another, and then inside the black box they put it together so that the, um, the sub-suppliers don't see the finished product. That's the business I'm in, and I won't go into too, de in too much detail, but know that there are third parties out there that can kind of, in a hidden block back box, put things together. All right, um, real quick, it's not enough just to register your brands and try to limit your exposure, but you need to monitor it. Um, how do you do that? Here's some really simple ways. Find out which trade shows your suppliers are going to. Usually they're excited to tell you that they're going to be at the Dusseldorf trade show in December or wherever they're going. So they'll show you a list of the trade shows. And whether you go or someone else or you just look at the websites, make sure that this, the seller isn't taking your proprietary designs and trying to sell them to someone else. Because what will happen is the boss of the factory will sign that non-disclosure, non-compete, but his sales manager doesn't know about the document. So the sales manager is like really proud of this product that they made. So he puts it in his bag to take with him. And now your product ends up for sale in the, in the public. Same is true for stock room, showroom, company website, internet um, sales, I'm sorry, internet sales channels like Taobao and Tmall and China brochures. So just keep an eye on it. Also, every once in a while, have a friend of yours pretend to be the dummy customer call up this supplier and ask to buy your product. <laughs> and if the supplier says, sure, well, here's the price. Okay, so much for respecting non-disclosure, non-compete. Um, believe it or not, I am, I am nine for nine in court cases in China. As a foreigner in China, I have won or settled to my satisfaction. So don't feel that you can't fight in China if your intellectual property has been compromised. Assuming you've got the contracts in place, clear specifications, I, I'm sorry, clear um, agreement for what is to be protected. I had one case where I went into the, the courthouse just to find out how's the process going to work. Um, I was using Chinese because they didn't speak English there. And the front desk said, hold on a second, come meet the judge. So they let me around back of this office, and I'm sitting down with the judge that's going to handle my case. He's like, tell me what happened. And so I told him. He picked up the phone, called the supplier, and said, Mike's in my office. I looked it over. You're going to lose. Why don't you settle right now? That would never happen in America, that the judge gets involved. But he had so many things to do on his plate, so many court cases that more more important. He figured, all right, I'll you know, I'll help this foreigner out and settle it. And, and yeah, the, I, we came to terms with that, that supplier. So the, the Chinese judge went out of his way to help me um, deal with an IP issue. OK, that was a lot. Um, I told you I wouldn't promote my company, but I said nothing about promoting my book. So here's a shameless plug for my, my 300 pages of my experiences in China, a bunch of templates. You can find it on Amazon, or um, you can go online at China Sourcing Info. It's in, it's a, you can buy it in hard copy. If you buy it in ebook, you could pay tonight and be reading it on the airplane tomorrow. Um, before we go to question and answer, I want to just refresh a couple things. If you only remember three things from today, find the right supplier. You know, don't hope that it's the right supplier. Be pretty sure that it's the right supplier um, before you place that purchase order, before you give them the money. If you don't have the budget to do things right, which usually means inspection, auditing, bilingual contracts, visiting the factory, don't do it. You know, maybe buy domestically. Get yourself up a slush fund or a war chest until you're big enough to do it right. There's nothing embarrassing about not buying from China this time so that you can do it right next year. And I'll put it in red and say it over and over again. Every time person I meet in China, I'm sorry, every foreigner that I meet in China says, how do I source safely? I should have it tattooed on my arm. I say, make sure that the name on the bank account is the same as the name on the contract is the same on, name on the address. Now, before we go to question. I hope you're going to make me look good with some questions. Um, I'll leave up some resources on the background. Here's our booth number and where you'll find us. And my blog is the China Sourcing, China Sourcing Info. And also there's an advanced buyer blog for buyers that purchase more than $2 million a year. I write a special blog for them at PSS China. Supplier blacklist is where you can find the bad suppliers. I read that all the time. 
Sourcing Service Center is where you can find help if you need it. And uh, I'm, you can find me via uh, chinasourcinginfo.org. Um, also, by the way, are there any Spanish speakers, native Spanish speakers in the audience? Anybody speak Spanish? Okay, we've got one. Also know that uh, Simon from Barcelona has been kind enough to volunteer to translate much of our content into Spanish. So we're, <laughs> you're, you're doing the hard work, Simon. Um, okay, on that note, I'd be happy to have a glass of water here and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. We have a microphone that can go around for questions. Also, the, um, there's another conference that just started about um, the future of peripherals. So if you want to go check that out, I won't be offended if you leave. However, if you do want to ask some questions, I'll stick around for another, another 10 minutes or so if you have questions. Any questions now? Yeah, thank you. I have a question. Uh, when, you were talking about, when you were talking about tooling, yes. uh, I had an incident where uh, I was making shopping bags. Okay. So I bought, I bought the plates in mm -hmm. advance, and it was a separate line item Good. Okay. for the plates. At the end, when I decided that he couldn't meet my demand and I needed to transfer the plates, yeah. he said that the plates belonged to him. Yeah. Because it wasn't listed in the contract, even though I paid separately for it. Well, and I lost, so is that? Um, you paid separately for it, but was it a line item separated on the contract? On the purchase order. But it was under the purchase order, so it was bundled in with, some, with something else. No, it was else. just plates, you know, $1,000. No, no, that's... that's uh, Especially if it was in Chinese, but even if it was in English, what it wasn't, it wasn't in Chinese. what normally would happen is a demand letter would be issued from the lawyer. Let's say negotiations have fallen apart, so diplomacy is not getting anywhere. Then uh, hire a Chinese lawyer from a reputable law firm that will contact that supplier in Chinese, saying I reviewed the case and um, you know we're going to go to litigation unless you return the tooling. Here's clear the supporting evidence, and then that supplier has a decision to make. Usually. They assume that you won't, you don't know that tactic, so they play hardball and don't release well, the tooling. Was a thousand dollars? I just abandoned. Uh, you know. A demand letter will cost under five hundred dollars U.S. in most cases from uh, uh, from some of the law firms I'm associated with. So, you know, if the order is five hundred dollars, unless you want just the moral victory of doing it, but and you're right, in some cases it doesn't make sense. But you were wise to have it as a separate line item. Um, tooling. I, during the financial crisis, when suppliers lost their orders from the West and went out of business, I had uh, too many uh, fact American buyers and European buyers I know that had the contracts. They listened to me, but then the tooling was liquidated because the factory went out of business overnight. So it's not even enough to have the contracts. You actually want to physically have the tooling, if possible, in your hands. But you're you're 99 percent there. <laughs> not not bad. Congratulations. Okay. What what other questions do we have today? All right, one question. I want to come back. Come on, someone, someone think of no questions. All right, great. In the front. I want to talk about your tattoo. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so you said that the same bank account and the mm -hmm. same factory name and the same on the contract. Yeah. But what it really gives, uh, you know, for me as a buyer, uh, I think 90% over here is using Hong Kong bank account yeah. and the rest is in China because of the taxation. Yeah. So how you can in the end execute in this way of you know signing everything and the other way? Sure. Well the I difference? yeah how I would to execute this is the question. Yeah I would I would try to get the uh, jurisdiction of the contract um, where the factory has access assets and the contract can even stipulate that this is our contract Mr. Supplier I'm paying to your Hong Kong branch but that does not relieve you from the fulfilling this contractual term. So you can put that, tie it into the contract. It would be safer if it's all together. Um, also, the contract by itself never protects you. So my negotiations are usually, I want to, I want to pay the money directly to your factory in Guangzhou. Guangzhou supplier says, well, for tax reasons, we can give it to you at a cheaper price if you if you sell it to, if we buy it out of Hong Kong. Well, that's not safe for me. How about you give me some flex flexibility with the payment terms? So instead of 50-50, maybe we move to 30-70. You know, so I use that as part of the negotiation to protect myself through payment terms, even if I can't get the ideal protection in the contracts. Um, but e either way, you know, you can 
you can put in the China contract that payment to um, a, a second, a, another account um, is the responsibility. Because I, I have some, I try not to do it on, on big orders, but um, one time I, I did send like ten thousand dollars to the CFO's a personal account, and it was in the contract, and everything went well. But it was one of those where I was a little bit nervous. I needed it to go out just in time, so I broke my own rules, and it could have gone very bad. So even I break these rules every once in a while, but I, I use it as a chance to negotiate something better somewhere else. Okay, uh, enjoy the show today. Thanks for your time, and uh, you know where to reach me if you have any questions. Best wishes. Thank you. Thanks.